Hello, thank you for being in a new video. This time I have with me the Galaxy S24 Plus. Let's give it a full review. Let's get started. This Samsung device could very well be called Galaxy S24 Pro, but for some reason Samsung has not used this surname on its high-end series, so it prefers to only have the standard edition, plus edition and ultra edition. But if you are familiar for example with the iPhone nomenclature, you may think that this device is still very basic, however let's get to know it because it offers very good features and that also causes its price to be not so low, although I honestly believe that I have even seen other more expensive devices with less outstanding features than this one so I feel that it is not so far-fetched although you know that in Mexico prices are usually much more expensive. Its advertised price for this region is 23,999 pesos. That's about $1,405 approximately. Although remember that the prices here are not the same as over there. This is for the base version but of course there is also a version with more storage and if you take advantage of some Samsung promotions you could purchase the more storage versions for the price of the base edition but that could be changing and you know that the price can change over time. The good thing about Samsung is that they offer widespread distribution, so let's just say that it's relatively easy to purchase one of these devices. You don't need to go to a specific store, you can find it in many stores. So let's see below what it can offer us to compete against its main rivals, which in this case is practically its only rival in the same price range. It could be the iPhone 15 Pro, but in the most basic storage unit. So let's see what Samsung can offer. Personally, I consider that it does have a very attractive design on the front, offering very thin bezels, and in fact I could say that's symmetrical. The screen occupies much of the front, but in this case, unlike the Ultra model, does not release the Gorilla Armor glass, but only stays with Gorilla Glass Victus 2, which is a resistant glass, but does not have the anti-reflective enhancement that we do see in his older brother. So I would have loved to see that enhancement present on this model as well. That would be a point that I didn't like so much, but I insist anyway, it still has a good level of resistance with this glass. The frame will be made of aluminum of a quite resistant level. In this case, we find the power button on the right side, which will also serve to call Bixby and the volume buttons. On the top, there are two microphones and a band in plastic to help the connectivity of the antennas. By the way, these frames have a completely straight finish, which gives it a touch very similar to what we see on the iPhone. The left side is completely clean without any ports or buttons and at the bottom we find the slot to place the nano sim card. Pay close attention because you can put a micro SD card in it. On one side of this slot there is also a microphone, then the USB-C port. And finally the speaker with a new design which is no longer in a grid, we will talk a little later about the sound. This device weighs 196 grams and has a thickness of 7.7 millimeters, so it's very thin though not exaggeratedly light, but in general most high-end devices devices are not usually very light, so honestly it has a very nice feel to it when you hold it. And in addition to the tough glass and the hard aluminum frame, this device gives us IP68 certification, so if you happen to drop it in the water, it shouldn't be damaged. Although you know that, if you are going to immerse it in a pool or seawater, it is recommended that you do it for a short time, and after that activity, rinse it with pure water, since this certification is obtained precisely in pure water. And you know that no manufacturer will make the warranty valid if it is damaged by water. On this occasion, I got my hands on an edition that is distributed exclusively in the online store. The color is called Sapphire Blue. Other online exclusive colors available are jade green and orange. And the basic color palette in physical distribution includes violet, amber yellow, onyx black and marble gray. So a strong point of this device is its wide variety of colors so that you can specifically choose the color you like the most. Although definitely that the device has a very minimalistic and simple design and that might seem unattractive to many users and very appealing to other types of users. Either way, if you usually put a case on your device, you won't be too interested in the design on the back cover. Possibly the screen is the most spectacular thing about this device, as it is a 6.7 inch panel in its diagonal, so it offers a very good size. But the highlight here is its resolution, which is Quad HD+, which in conjunction with this screen size gives us a pixel density of 513 pixels per inch. 
So it is an exaggeratedly detailed screen, very sharp, which not only will serve you to see perfectly well multimedia content such as movies or series, but also texts with very small fonts will look exaggeratedly sharp. To be exact, the resolution is 3120 by 1440 pixels. The technology of this screen is Dynamic AMOLED 2X that is the latest from Samsung and achieves a brightness that is very high, a peak of 2600 nits, in this case when you're watching HDR content as is the case. So you'll notice that the display gives off a lot of brightness in certain areas. Definitely the viewing experience with this display is very good because it also gives us vivid colors, very high contrast and you can choose between different color calibrations in case you want colors a little bit less saturated or a little bit more saturated. The screen calibration, personally I really liked it. It looks very nice, especially because in this generation they have also included for the first time the adaptive color tone option, which will make the white color of the screen look like the white color of the environment. And honestly, this gives you a very comfortable viewing experience, so I would recommend always having it enabled, unless you're used to the screen looking the same in all environments but the most comfortable experience is having this option turned on. And of course it offers us, as I was telling you, a very high brightness but also an extremely low minimum brightness to make it very comfortable to view this screen at night. In addition, it has a refresh rate that goes from 1 to 120 Hz, therefore it is a screen that could also become very efficient in power consumption, because when it is showing static content, the refresh rate will go down, and when it is showing moving content, it is also going to rise so that the movements look very fluid and very smooth. It's definitely a spectacular display that could very well be a highlight. Let me tell you now details of the sound, because not only we have a speaker that is at the bottom, but also the earpiece for calls is going to be a speaker. Although honestly, personally, I would like another audio output on the outside so that we would have symmetrical sound, but in this case, the speaker in charge of emitting the highest quality is the bottom speaker, which will have a little bit more bass frequencies. However, overall, the sound is going to be of excellent quality. I have no complaints regarding the clarity, crispness or equalization that these speakers have. The sound is super nice, but I would love to have a more symmetrical sound. For now, how about listening to a little test? Although remember that it's not the same to listen to it live. The speaker volume is also considerably loud, although I don't think it's their strongest point, but something strong in Samsung is that it offers us not only Dolby Atmos for music and other things with different surround presets, but also Dolby Atmos for games and even a 9-band equalizer that is available at all times and not only when you connect headphones. In addition, you have different presets or you can completely customize your music experience. So it's a great feature for those who like to tweak the sound experience. In fact, you could also adapt the sound based on tests that the device does depending on your age. Another outstanding feature on Samsung is the independent application sound that allows you to keep some applications playing on your cell phone, while other applications send their sound to some Bluetooth speaker. With this, you could perfectly watch some video while you are listening to music on your speaker at some party or something, so it's definitely very useful when you have your cell phone connected to a speaker, and it's a feature that is usually only offered by Galaxy devices. It's worth noting that it doesn't have a headphone jack, although this is pretty standard on high-end devices, so you will have to use headphones through the USB-C port, or you can also opt to use wireless headphones. In this case, in addition to supporting the SPC and AAC codec, it will also support the APTX codec that can be used for higher resolution audio. But the best experience on this device will be when using Galaxy Buds that are compatible with Samsung's own SSC codec. The bad thing is that despite being such an expensive device, it doesn't include more advanced codecs like LDAC. So you can't enjoy a very high resolution audio experience with those codecs. Regarding the microphones, I already mentioned their positions. So there are three microphones in total. One of them focused on noise reduction. So you're stuck with the basics. Personally, I would like to see another microphone near the camera module to have a little more directional audio. But that Samsung is reserving for the Ultra model only. So I feel like the audio capture experience is gonna be basic. Obviously good quality, but it stays basic. 
Next, we'll listen to a test recorded with these microphones. Esta es una prueba de audio grabada con los micrófonos del Galaxy S24 Plus en un ambiente silencioso. These microphones record audio very well and also won't get saturated when you're in very high volume situations like at concerts. The front camera is 12 megapixels with f2.2 aperture. It doesn't have a high resolution sensor, but it does have autofocus. So that's a plus. Remember that it has a camera quick launch by double tapping on the button, and you can also switch between the front camera and the main camera by making a simple gesture. It offers two levels of width. In the wider format, it offers us the full 12 megapixel resolution, and in the close format, it offers us a 9 megapixel picture. The capture speed is considerably fast. In addition, if we slide down the shutter, we can have a burst to make multiple gestures and faces to select the photo we like the most. If we hold down the shutter, we can start recording a video in short format, but if you slide up, you can also continue recording so you don't have to hold the button constantly. In the upper right corner, we can access some filters that will appear at the bottom. All of them can be previewed in real time and we can also adjust their intensity. In addition, we have another face category to have facial beauty. We can turn on the option and manipulate various parameters such as softness, tone, jawline and eye size, so we can completely customize the beauty mode experience. And there is even a third category that is going to allow us to select whether we want a slightly warmer or natural color setting. Personally, I really like the way the selfies come out with the warm setting, but it's up to you as a user which color rendition you prefer. Possibly the front camera will be one of its strongest points because you notice how it has an excellent level of detail. The truth is that the photography is very good, also retaining a very accurate color rendition. And the fact that it has autofocus allows that despite being very close or very far from the camera, it still maintains a very high level of detail. It's definitely one of the most spectacular front-facing cameras I've seen lately. Despite not being high resolution, you notice the amount of detail it is capable of picking up. It's spectacular. It offers two levels of wide and in the widest mode you could get to have a good group shot, mostly because of the autofocus, although honestly the lens isn't that wide compared to others I've reviewed. So group photography has its pros and cons. Indoors, the photography looks good in terms of lighting and also the accuracy of colors and their saturation, but it loses a lot of level of detail due to the fact that there is no longer as much illumination as we see outdoors. Also, in the slightly darker areas, it will appear slightly more grainy, so it's not as spectacular a camera when there's not as much light. Speaking of which, in scenes that are backlit, the preview still doesn't look optimized like it will on the rear camera. But after taking the picture, the result does look very good balancing highlights and shadows well. Believe me, this was a pretty complex backlit photograph because of the amount of lighting reflecting off the ground. And in this case, it makes a good balance and good balance. So the backlit photograph I did like. In the evenings, if you're close to some light source, I think it's going to come out a good photograph, although again, not as much detail as what we had seen in the daytime. But I think the picture is good without being spectacular because in the darker areas, there will be a little more grain, but nothing really serious. Notice how in the most difficult difficult lighting conditions, Samsung does a good job of handling noise as it seems to eliminate it almost completely, although it is not as capable of illuminating the face well. Although I repeat this is one of the more complex scenarios because of the low level of light on the face from the front and the very high level of light on the back. Note how using the night mode tries to improve this capture a little but it is still not perfect. Ideally, use the screen as a flash simulation and see how you achieve a slightly better balanced photograph, although in these scenarios a little more noise reappears. It doesn't look like the perfect camera to me, but it does perform well. Notice how portraits at night with the front camera come out very well. I like the level of detail it achieves and the natural blur it generates in the background. And in the daytime, this front camera is also capable of taking a good portrait, in fact far superior to what we find in the vast majority of smartphones today, as it is not only able to detect the foreground on faces or body, but also on other objects that are in the foreground. It tries to detect them, maybe not with 100% accuracy, but much better than the vast majority of smartphones today. So portrait photography with the front camera seems to me to be among the best on the market.
This device allows us to use the high resolution mode, obviously only with the main camera, which is the one with this type of sensors, the picture looks very good. So it allows us to do some cropping to still maintain a good level of detail. So it definitely does allow us to take advantage of the full resolution of this sensor. In motion photography, the main camera does a good job of keeping the subject static without any sweeping effect. The ultra wide camera performs pretty much the same as does the telephoto camera, obviously in good lighting conditions. So I think the system performs very well in these kinds of conditions. On the back, we're going to find the 13mm ultra wide camera with 12 megapixels and f2.2 aperture, but it doesn't have autofocus, so it doesn't work for macro shots. Then we have the 23mm camera considered as the main camera with 50 megapixels, f1.8 aperture, autofocus, and optical stabilization. And since this camera has a high resolution sensor, applying a crop on that sensor, we would have a virtual telephoto camera of 50 millimeters. That is zoom 2x, maintaining optical quality with 12 megapixels. And finally, we have the telephoto camera of 70 millimeters, that is approximately 3x, with 10 megapixels, aperture f2.4, autofocus, and optical stabilization. That is, in general, unlike many other manufacturers, Samsung offers only one high-resolution sensor, so the rest of the cameras do not look so powerful. However, the experience will definitely be very good. Let's do a test by trying to capture the number 3, to see how fast the capture can be. We'll make a second attempt to be absolutely sure that the device takes the photos fast. And note, it recently received an update that has vastly improved the capture speed, as before the update, it was very tricky to capture the exact moment. In this case, I even got a little bit ahead of the capture, so it performs very well in speed. In fact, just like on the front camera, you could slide down the shutter to initiate a burst capture. Again, notice how fast it initiated the burst capture, so we could capture the exact moment we want. In addition, it supports the burst of up to 100 photos. In this camera interface, we are also going to find the button in the upper right corner to be able to enable some special color filter or also to have some beauty effects. In this case, with exactly the same parameters that we see on the front camera, if we tap on screen we can adjust the focus and exposure, but notice that we can also access the pro mode to have more control over all these parameters. The ISO can go up to 3200, and in the case of shutter speed we're going to go up to 30 seconds of exposure. We can also adjust compensation, focus and white balance. In addition to more parameters in this part, such as contrast, highlights, shadows, saturation and tint, if we want to customize our photograph in a very specific way. In the settings of this camera we can select in which format we want to save the photos in pro mode since you could save the photos in raw for a more advanced later development. But for the more advanced users it would be advisable to install the expert raw application which is available for this device which would also allow you to take pictures in 24 megapixels. In addition it offers you even more tools within this application, such as a tool for multiple exposure or also the capture of the stars at night or some filters that you can apply lighting. So, for professional photography, it offers very good tools by default, although this application has to be downloaded with an internet connection. And the smart capture on this camera is very good, because notice how it immediately detects that it's a document and does the scanning for you. In fact, it also allows you to extract the text in digital format, or you can also select to automatically crop the image for you, although in this case it is saved as a photograph, unlike other manufacturers that apply an optimization so that it looks very similar to what you would find in a physical scanner. And this image, obviously, you can send it to print, either physically or also by selecting the option to save it as a PDF document. On the other hand, it is also capable of scanning QR codes directly in the main camera interface without opening an additional application. The main camera, obviously, will be the one that is going to offer us more quality and more level of detail. Color saturation seems to me to be just enough. It feels a good rendering, maybe the blue color a little more saturated than it was in reality. But what I notice in this camera is a slightly out of focus area with a bit of distortion at the bottom. So it doesn't strike me as the most advanced camera on the market. In fact, if we switch to the ultra wide lens, we're going to notice good quality at first glance. But if we zoom in a little bit closer to notice some details, we're going to see a little bit of noise, slight chromatic aberration, and a little bit of distortion at the edges. So I insist that it is not a camera that is 100% optimized. 
There are other manufacturers that not only put high resolution sensors in the main camera, but also in the ultra wide camera and the telephoto camera. But it seems that Samsung is a bit comfortable in this aspect. I think that for the next generation, Samsung should improve the sensors that it incorporates in these devices because it does not look like a photograph of the price you are paying since there are other devices that will give us higher resolution and higher quality in the lenses. The telephoto camera offers a 3x optical zoom and maintains a good quality. It is definitely a device that takes good pictures at long distances maintaining a good color between all its lenses. Here you are looking at the 10x digital zoom picture where it maintains good quality and the maximum it allows is 30x zoom. Obviously it will be a fully digital zoom and not having a high resolution sensor for the telephoto camera, I think it may lose a little more detail. It's definitely not a bad picture, but I think for the price, we're already starting to see other devices with better zoom quality. Although if you compare it with the zoom that the iPhone is capable of giving you, Samsung is definitely offering us a superior zoom. For macro photography, we are going to find a good experience with the main camera. I think the ideal will be to apply some digital zoom to have a good result. Since in this case the ultra wide camera does not have autofocus unlike the ultra model. So we cannot get as close to the objects but I insist that by applying some digital zoom we can solve this issue and still have a good photographic quality. Indoors, it seems to me that Samsung maintains a good performance with the three cameras. Note how the ultra wide camera can get to have a little more noise and graininess in darker areas but overall it maintains a good performance while the main camera is the one that maintains greater sharpness. Evidently, having a high resolution sensor, it allows to have a better management of lighting by merging these pixels. But the telephoto camera also does a good job in these types of scenes despite not having as much illumination. In the case of backlit scenes, Samsung has made an update on this device, so now it does look like an optimized preview, unlike past generations where the background could look completely white. In this case, Samsung has improved this and you have to applaud it because there are very few Android manufacturers these days that have a preview this good. And after taking the picture, it still looks even better as the few areas that looked overexposed in the preview in the final picture look much better. We have an excellent result with a good balance of light and shadow. This photograph was quite tricky, but Samsung has solved it in a good way. The ultra wide camera also performs excellently in this type of light and shadow conditions. Although in these backlit scenes could become much more noticeable chromatic aberration that can generate this lens, confirming that it is not as high quality as we would like in such an expensive device. Although this is for the most demanding, obviously if you are not so demanding with respect to the details of your photography, you will enjoy this experience. I also tested with the telephoto camera in these types of conditions and again we see an excellent balance of highlights and shadows. That's something I like about Samsung, which maintains a fairly consistent performance among its three lenses. Now we move to nighttime to test this camera. The main camera honestly performs barely acceptable. I feel that it should better optimize the balance of lights and shadows in this type of scenarios. But even when using the night mode, I am struck by the fact that even when using the night mode, we do not see a significant evolution if it manages to balance slightly better these areas. But believe me, there are other devices that will do a better job in this type of night photography. The ultra wide camera, we are also going to notice that it has this same detail Although in this case even with more noise and grain present, which it tries to disguise a little when you enable night mode. But I insist there is not so much difference when you use or don't use night mode in this type of scenes. In fact, notice how the telephoto camera behaves exactly the same with and without night mode. I feel that you need to improve night mode a lot if you want to have better optimized and balanced pictures, especially with respect to lighting capture. But on the other hand, in darker areas where there is not such an intense light source, the result is spectacular. Note how the ultra wide camera already gives us an excellent result. Although again, there is not so much difference between night mode and automatic mode. But that can be a good thing in these kinds of darker and more difficult scenes since you don't need to enter a specific mode to get a very good picture. Although with the main camera we did notice a very bad color balance in automatic mode and it improves a lot with the night mode to be more accurate and gain more detail. Finally note that when zooming in it is not using the telephoto camera because it is a very dark scene. So when we are in a scene with more darkness the device will give preference to use digital zoom. Even using night mode it is still digital zoom although it does improve. 
But being such an expensive device, I wanted to do an even more complicated test and from the preview, Samsung gives us a good result. Because in this case, it was a situation with really very low lighting. And notice how it automatically detects that you are going to use a long exposure. The main camera achieves a spectacular result, picking up a very good level of light. Believe me, it was a super dark scene, but the main camera managed to take a good picture practically free of noise, although the level of detail is not so high, but compared against what it was in reality, believe me, it is a super well lit picture. But notice that if you use the night mode manually, it's going to improve the picture a lot. So in this kind of scenes where there is too much darkness, you can notice a difference between the automatic mode and the night mode. The result really surprised me for the better. The ultra-wide camera also achieves a good result illuminating this area well despite the fact that it has an aperture that is not so wide for light to enter. Although in this case there is not much difference between using the night mode or the automatic mode. And as I anticipated in this type of very dark conditions, it does not use the telephoto lens but uses digital zoom. But anyway, using this night mode with the digital zoom you get a really good capture. I insist this scene was very dark and that's why I can highlight the result it has. And finally with respect to other details note that if the ultra wide camera is not enough for you you can use the panoramic mode with the ultra wide camera to have a super wide capture with lots of information and above all what I highlight of its panoramic mode is that it maintains a good level of detail. But you could also use the panoramic mode with the main camera and again you have a very good level of detail and good space around you so you can get to have a very wide picture. And finally we evaluated the portrait photography which seems to be of good quality although I feel that the colors are much more saturated than I would like. So it doesn't look as natural the result with respect to color rendition but it does make a very good detection between foreground and background. Ideally we would take these portrait shots with a bit of zoom to have a more natural result so the device lets us take portrait shots with a 2x and 3x setting. Where I like the result the most is at the 3x setting as at 2x it could come out a little darker but believe me the result is very good with the 3x lens detecting the foreground perfectly even with objects and not only with faces so the result is very good the bokeh effect that is generated looks very natural. So portrait photography really did leave me satisfied on this device. For video recording there is good news because it offers support for video up to 8K although in this case only with the main camera but with the other cameras we can also record using the 4K setting at 60 frames per second. In fact the front camera also supports this setting thus confirming that this is a flagship device. But in this case, unlike the Galaxy S24 Ultra, it does not offer recording at 120 frames per second within the Pro mode. So if you wanted that, you must purchase the higher version. But since we are inside the Pro Video mode, I remind you that in this mode it has an audio meter, as well as various settings to have the perfect picture that you want. But also regarding the audio, you can configure which microphone you want to use. In this case, not only internal microphones, but you could also use external microphones via USB, Bluetooth, or make a mix of these microphones. So we have also very good options for professional video, not only in image, but also in audio. And in auto mode, while you're recording, we're going to have a convenient slider for zooming, including some presets to make a quick change. In fact, if you press and hold, more presets will also appear at the bottom. We can also turn on the flashlight while we are recording and we can also pause and resume our content. And what's remarkable about Samsung is that in addition to taking pictures while you're recording, it lets you rotate to the front camera without the need to cut your video recording. So you gain much more versatility compared to other devices. The only detail I noticed is that if you're recording in 4K at 60 frames per second, you're not going to be able to switch between the three rear camera lenses, although it does let you rotate to the front camera with this setting. So I think there are still little things to be perfected, but it is one of the best devices in terms of camera versatility. This device allows you to record video at up to 8K and the result is spectacular. It would allow you to zoom in on this video and still maintain a very good level of detail. Although obviously it will not be a resolution that you will use on a daily basis, but it is nice to have the option. It is not as recommended to record in this resolution because you will not have a very good light management because you will be totally focused on capturing the maximum level of detail possible. It would be more appropriate to record in 4K and note that in this case the ultra wide camera also has these recording capabilities. Although it honestly feels that the lens is not as high quality as we had already mentioned in the picture. 
On the other hand, the main camera feels like it has much better quality when recording in this resolution and the telephoto camera can also record and something to note is that if it allows us to switch between all these lenses, perhaps the transition is not so friendly and in the darker areas you might get to notice a little more noise when you are zooming in. So, I don't think it's the most spectacular for video recording, but it does give a good enough experience, especially in the most illuminated areas. Indoors, what I noticed is that it does not maintain a good consistency as if we had seen in other sections, since the ultra-wide camera looks much warmer compared to what the main camera offers. So in video recording, I don't think it's such an outstanding device. The telephoto camera does perform well but again gives us a slightly warmer scene compared against the main camera. Then the color balance would need to be perfected because it seems to be a bit inconsistent. But I like the color saturation, the noise handling and the level of detail this device achieves recording in these conditions. Recording backlit also maintains excellent performance balancing highlights and shadows very well even when there is a face present, unlike other devices that could cause a lot of exposure jumping or focus issues. In this case, both with the main camera and the ultra-wide camera, we are going to have a good performance recording in this kind of conditions. Notice how even though at the moment of switching there is a slightly overexposed area with the ultra-wide camera, it still maintains good quality, and even when recording with the telephoto camera it maintains a good balance of highlights and shadows unlike other devices that perform very poorly when recording with the telephoto lens in backlit conditions. So this is a strong point. At night, the ultra-wide camera manages to disguise the presence of noise very well, so it gives us a good performance, although again it is not as capable of balancing highlights lights and shadows well, and in darker areas it could have more noise present. The main camera manages to balance this light and shadow situation better, but the color balance could get a bit confused, and in the darker areas, the ultra-wide camera is going to suffer a lot more to capture the level of detail. And the main camera is going to have quite a bit of noise present, so I think it's not the best of exponents in video recording when we're in difficult lighting situations. In fact, the reflections that you get to generate on the lens can get a little bit annoying as well. And remember that if you try to zoom in, it's not going to have a very good light input because the telephoto lens that it has, it doesn't have such a spectacular aperture. So, in these very complex video recording conditions, it's not going to give you a good result. Fortunately, it does maintain excellent stabilization when recording video, even without the super stable mode enabled. And this also note that it is using all three lenses. In this sense, it also maintains good stabilization consistency. Even in the most complicated scenes of a lot of action, recording with the ultra-wide camera, we have an excellent performance. With the main camera, you may notice a little more compensation movements, but it is still excellent. Even recording with the telephoto camera, with a lot of action, we have a very good stabilization result. Obviously, if you record with the super stable mode, you will have an even better result. It will record with the ultra-wide camera by default, but it does allow you to switch to the main camera while you are running. Obviously, the result will be very good. Although in this case, the resolution is a bit lower than in the video. One positive thing is that this cell phone lets you record using portrait mode. The result is considerably good. Note how it is able to keep the foreground in focus and blur the background. Although the result is slightly artificial, I think that among all Android smartphones this is one of the best results. Even the intensity of the blur will vary depending on whether you are far away or close to the camera. It also maintains a good stabilization, but at times it is not able to keep the foreground in focus if they are objects. It only keeps in focus the faces or the body. It also allows you to record with this mode using the 2x setting for a slightly more realistic experience. Another plus point of this portrait recording is that it can be in 4K. Another thing I liked about this device is that its fast camera can go with a good setting for people movements that has stabilization and that is on challenge. Although it's not able to go as fast as other devices I've seen, so you wouldn't be able to record spectacular landscapes or plant growth. The slow motion is also good as it can even be in 4K resolution at 120 frames per second. So. It's one of the few devices that allow you to record in slow motion while retaining the 4K resolution and the result, believe me, is very good. In fact, you can also get up to 240 frames per second in Full HD and in this case the result is also positive. But what I didn't like is that they have removed the super slow motion mode that went up to 960 frames per second in the last generation. So here you don't have such a spectacular slow motion in terms of slowness.
The front camera also has excellent video recording quality. I find that it maintains good color rendition and also has good stabilization without the need to crop the angle so much. So you can be well framed in the camera and in this case it also maintains a constant exposure. We're also going to find autofocus so you can zoom in on some objects to show them to the audience and if you're going to be able to focus them well. Regarding the backlighting, even though it does a good enough job, I think it's not that spectacular as there are still areas that look slightly overexposed, giving it priority to light up your face a bit better. So, in this aspect, it still feels like it could do better. Indoors, this camera, I think, maintains good colors, but it does get to look a little more motion strange due to the noise reduction it's trying to apply. I also feel that it is a little less contrasty video than I would like, but this is understandable due to the low light conditions that may be present in some areas. In the evening, something very similar will happen. If you are close to a light source, I think you can still get a very good result. Although if it is a scene with a lot more movement, the presence of noise will be more noticeable. Obviously, in the more complicated areas where there is a lot of darkness, the device will not be able to do a good job. Although it is a very complicated thing to do, believe me, I have seen other mobile devices, even less expensive ones, perform better in these extreme dark conditions. So I think Samsung could still improve this camera a lot. Fortunately, the fast camera experience with the front camera is very similar to the rear, so it maintains good stabilization and an excellent level of detail, plus a good bit rate. So anytime you pause the video, you're still going to see a good level of detail, unlike other devices. It also has slow motion up front here, although it's a little basic, but it might come in handy for some creative scenes. What I liked is that it also has portrait video mode on the front camera and the result is excellent. In fact, I liked it better than what we were seeing with the rear camera as the effect doesn't look so artificial and notice how it even lets you change the effects so you can reduce the level of blur intensity or raise it to a very high level although at this higher level you can get to notice how artificial the result is but it is up to you as a user what you want to use. In fact, you could also enable special effects like black and white or a glitch effect, although in this case it is also not able to detect objects in the foreground as it did in portrait shots. So it could get better, but trust me, it's a completely superior portrait recording mode to the vast majority of mobile devices. Finally, the device offers us dual recording mode with excellent quality. You can choose two cameras and you can move this picture-in-picture -picture mode box. What I do not like about this Samsung recording mode is that it does not allow us to apply zoom and in fact it does not allow us to switch between the main camera, the ultra wide and telephoto as if we saw it before. In addition, the result is in full HD unlike the ultra model that does allow us to record in 4K using this dual recording mode. Using the main camera, it does allow us to have autofocus, but I insist it does not let us zoom, so we have to stop recording and start it again every time we want to switch between any camera. And even being in telephoto does not allow us to zoom in, so we are a little limited, especially in the management of the zoom. In the rest of the sections, the experience will be extremely good using this dual recording mode, so hopefully Samsung will still improve this section. This device has been presented with One UI 6.1 and Android 14. In fact, it recently received its February security patch update, which was one of the most anticipated updates. In fact, this device is going to receive 7 years of software updates and security patches, so it will have a very extended lifespan and that may be a buying point, as it is a very strong point. Currently, it seems to me that few cell phones in the industry would be able to give you this level of support. Also, you know that Samsung tends to add a lot of things to its system, so it is able to differentiate itself a lot from other Android devices. For example, within the wallpaper section, we're going to find the creative wallpaper section with generative artificial intelligence. So you simply choose one of the categories and subsequently you can start describing more or less an image that you want to achieve. For example, an out of focus photo and you choose some category. In this case, I'm going to choose leaves and you can choose the tone you want it to have. For example, I'm going to choose a bright tone and then the device will intelligently generate this background in high resolution so you can enjoy it on your screen. In fact, you can select from different categories, so it can become more or less useful this section of generative wallpapers for you to have a unique image on your device.
But in case you want to place some wallpaper photo, notice how it is also going to give you the option to set it for the lock screen. And in this case, I want to talk to you about the features that you can have in customizing this screen. Because notice how you can choose a frame, for example, which can be of different shapes. And with some pictures, you could even zoom in and it's going to bring out the foreground. Only that's not possible with all the pictures. So let me select another one. Notice how in this case I'm going to select one of these frames and notice how when you zoom in, the face in the foreground can actually stand out from the rest of the picture. So it can give an interesting effect in your photo, although this differentiation of the foreground and background is only available when you use a frame, because if you don't use the frame you won't really be able to place the clock behind the person as you could for example with an iPhone. But it does have some color or blur effects that you can apply to your photos to create the wallpaper you like. You can also select a special background color so that you can have this transparency effect. And something very curious that you will notice is that now the always on display function can make the screen stay on all the time, even showing this background, very similar to what we saw recently with iPhone. In fact, many Samsung users came to criticize this feature on iPhone, but now it is also available on this device. I don't think it's a bad feature, but personally I wouldn't use it because it's going to consume a lot of battery. Fortunately, Samsung allows you to select whether or not you want it to always stay on, or if you want it to just work during a schedule or automatically, or just tap to display this background, or even just turn on when you receive a notification. So the customization is quite extensive, but the always on display feature is now available all the time. Although the always on display feature is very strange because although it has a specific setting with a full screen, actually if you want to set some always on display skins, you must enter the theme section and then access the always on display tab. Here you will be able to set some special covers that you want to display instead of your photos and your watch. Some are free, others are paid, but note how the operation will be very different. So I would like Samsung to unify more this configuration because from the always on display settings do not appear the configuration covers and that can get to cause a little confusion when using it. Samsung also offers the panels edge feature where you get to have direct access to applications and you can also get to open these applications in a floating mode if you drag them to the center or in a split screen mode if you drag them up or down. So we have an excellent management of applications in multi-view or also in a split screen mode because you can open many applications in this format. You will also be able to resize these applications and you can even apply a certain level of transparency on each of them. So this panel's edge feature will allow you to open these applications. You can even open even more apps, in fact any app you want, in this format. So Samsung is an expert when it comes to floating windows because it lets you open pretty much anything you want. But Panels Edge will not only serve you to manage applications in a floating window mode, but you can also enable other panels, for example for smart selection, tasks, weather and other widgets that you can even download from the Galaxy Store. For example, the tool for pinning content can come in handy when you are copying certain information. Simply select an area of the screen and you will always be present even if you enter any other application. Then it can even be useful for some kind of reminders or something like that. You can create other screen settings or perform actions of certain applications directly. In fact, it allows you to select a good amount of actions that you can have in this sidebar. And as I told you, you can also get to have some quick information widgets. In the advanced features section, in the lab setting, we're going to be able to enable multi-window for all apps. This is something that currently only Samsung has available and you can also select which apps you want to always run in dark mode even though you don't have dark mode enabled. But obviously the most attractive features of the entire Galaxy S24 series will be those of artificial intelligence and in this case it has exactly the same functions that we would find in the Galaxy S24 Ultra. That is to say, we are going to be able to have real-time call translation so you can talk to someone in another language and the device is going to function as an interpreter. So you have several options in this case. You choose your languages, you simply download the information so that this works even offline and you can configure whether you want your voice not to be heard but just the voice of the cell phone in the other language or whether you want both voices to be heard. In fact, you could also select whether or not you want to hear the other person in their original language. So it's a considerably good feature if you tend to talk to people of other languages a lot. Also on the Samsung keyboard we will find these generative artificial intelligence features, for example we have a section to translate chats, even compatible with WhatsApp, but it can also give you some style and grammar suggestions and of course it will be able to compose in other styles any text that you have written.
For example, here I have a message and I'm going to have this message rewarded by accessing the artificial intelligence button. And in this case, I can access two functions, style and writing, or also spelling and grammar. In writing style, watch how it makes an analysis of what I wrote and automatically gives me other styles. For example, it gives me the professional style that even does an internet search so that it quickly gives me all the instructions of what I am saying. There is another informal style, a social style, respectful. Then I like that he can write in a more extensive way things that you just write in a few simple lines. And with respect to spelling and grammar, notice how he can search for or correct some mistakes in case you have doubts if you wrote correctly. It also has the interpreter application that will also be available within the quick settings as a shortcut. This interpreter will be a voice translator that you can use in real time. You can select whether you want to press to speak or have everything done automatically. Observe, let's open the interpreter and notice how after giving the necessary permissions an interface will appear where both people can speak in different languages and the translation will be done without the need to connect to the internet. So it can be very useful when traveling. Within Samsung Notes it will also be able to read format the notes that you have written around here. So notice how I already have an extensive note in Samsung Notes and now I'm going to hit the artificial intelligence button so you can see the things that it can do. It could automatically format my note but unfortunately this tool works on very short texts. So I didn't really like that because honestly it's too short of a text so it wouldn't make much sense to format such a short text. But notice how you can actually put headings or bullets in these notes and it does a good job but I do wish it would support much longer text. In fact you can can have different formats, some with different colors so you can have more organized notes. So it does a good job, but I do wish it could handle much longer texts. Another feature you can have is the summary, but it automatically selects very little text, although fortunately the summary does work with the full text, so it can extract the useful data. It can also be useful to summarize very long notes, and obviously it can also make a translation or correct the spelling. Within the voice recorder we also have a summary function, in addition to the transcription. Only this function has to be turned on so that you can have it available and obviously you can download language packs to make this work without the need to have an internet connection. So I'm going to make a recording reading all this text that I have in my note, just so you can see how it can make a very good transcription. And that's it, I've got my almost 3 minute recording here, although this is compatible even with much longer recordings, so uh, there's no problem there. In fact, in this case I was the fastest, so the transcription is compatible with multiple speakers, and the transcription is going to distinguish the people who were participating in the recording. It takes a while to do the analysis, so don't think it's immediate, but I don't think it takes that long. After he analyzes all this, he will also be able to generate a summary. So look, here it shows me everything I was talking about, and in this case it recognizes that it was only one speaker. Now we are going to access the summary part. Obviously you have to accept the terms and conditions, and after a moment it shows you the keywords and the summary. And it does it in a really good way, so it can be very useful. And another area where you'll find artificial intelligence will be within the Samsung web browser. As you'll notice, it loads the page and at this bottom you have again the Galaxy AI button, which is going to allow you to summarize in a very quick way whatever it is that the page says. Here it gives you quick points and you can not only summarize but also translate the summary. And it will also allow you to translate the content to the language you want practically. Obviously, the translation is something that we had already seen on web pages, so it is not such a big novelty, but the summary, I think it can be very useful. Finally, in the gallery, remember that we will have an advanced photo editor with artificial intelligence. Again, here is the Galaxy AI button, and see how we can draw some line or select some objects that we want to move or delete. For example, let's see if it manages to detect this line. It detected only one area. I'm going to keep clicking on this line to see if it manages to detect a little bit more. It seems to struggle a little bit, so I'm going to try to enclose this line so that it will specifically be able to make this deleted. Now I have to hold down and select the eraser button. I could continue to make some other changes, for example, I'm going to try to also delete this object. Let's try to select it in a more or less precise way, and let's also select the option that we want to delete it. 
But as I tell you, it not only allows you to delete objects, it even allows you to move them. So I'm going to select this part and now I'm going to hold down to move this object to this area and even change its dimension. So I'm going to make this box bigger and I'm done with my editing. Now I simply have to press the generate button so that the device imagines everything it has to fill in the image and the final result is going to offer it in a few seconds. And presto, as you realize, a considerably good result was seen. In this case, notice how it filled with another object the area where I removed the object that was previously. This part he filled it as such with the floor pattern and the frame perfectly moved it and resized it. So this is the difference. The truth is that the image doesn't look fake or artificial. It looks very realistic. So we can get to have very interesting results with this artificial intelligence from Samsung. Notice how the images that are edited by artificial intelligence will have this Galaxy AI watermark, but that at the same time is very curious because you could easily crop that watermark or with the same object eraser that Samsung's editor comes with. You could just zoom in, select this option and put delete and just like that you're going to be able to have your picture without the watermark, so it's weird. Obviously, in the image metadata, we're also going to find that it was modified with generative editing. And obviously, in addition to the artificial intelligence tools, we also find here another object eraser and face effects and more things that we can do on our images. In fact, also remember that if you hold down on some object in your pictures, you could get to extract it. For example, in this case, you can copy it to another application because you can keep your finger pressed while you switch applications. Which can also be very useful or you can simply copy the image to the clipboard or you could also select to save it as a sticker. In fact, it includes several options of these stickers for you to save it personalized. Although the curious thing is that within Telegram images are sent as stickers, that is to say with transparency, but in WhatsApp they are sent as square images. So it does not have good compatibility yet. And as you know, in addition to extracting images, you could also get to extract text by simply holding down on a photo that has text to select it in digital format. In fact, also if you are playing a video, you could very well pause and hold down so that you can also select text from the image or also extract some images in sticker format. So we do have good options in this sense. And finally remember that Samsung includes the Samsung members application to offer discounts and promotions to its users. At the top you will be able to access this couponera that has partnerships with restaurants, clothing stores and many others depending on your region. In addition you can get to know more things and launches of Samsung. In general, One UI is the most advanced operating system that we currently have in cell phones offering very good options, very good interaction and in this case in conjunction with the X-axis optical engine will also give us a very good feedback. For example, when you load this timer page you feel those little taps when the interface is reacting giving you a feeling of a very mature operating system. Let's now talk about security and we start by talking about the fingerprint reader which in this case curiously supports 4 registrations. You have to consider that most devices support 5 registers so here you are a bit more limited. This I would consider a weak point especially if you are a user who likes to register people you trust. Here the difference is not so much but the number of fingerprints you can enroll is less. It is an ultrasonic fingerprint reader so it will work very fast unlike the optical readers that we usually see in mid-range devices. In this case it doesn't need to intensely illuminate this area of the screen to do the recognition and I insist that the unlocking is quite fast. So this is a very strong point, although note that in this case Samsung does not allow you to customize the unlock animation. Taking advantage of the reader is inside the screen, unlike the vast majority of manufacturers that do allow it. In this case we will also find facial recognition, although you know that it is in two dimensions, so it is not as recommended if your priority is security. Although in this case Samsung is even able to detect when you have lenses and will make the two records to have a much more accurate unlocking. In fact it also lets you select if you need to have your eyes open to perform the unlock so it has some additional security filters but in general I would not highly recommend using the facial unlock because it is only in two dimensions. For added security, remember that this device also includes extended unlocking, i.e. you can select or register some trusted place or some trusted device, so that while you are in these environments, the device does not ask you every time your unlock pattern or your fingerprint. Samsung also includes Samsung Pass, so you could perfectly remember your passwords and fill them automatically using your fingerprint. In addition, this will be synchronized between all your Galaxy devices, so if you have your tablet, you will also be able to have your password synchronized. 
But Samsung Pass not only allows you to fill in passwords, but also within the keyboard, you can open this Samsung Pass feature. And once you verify yourself with your fingerprint, you could get to insert all passwords manually, or you could also save your card information or addresses or any confidential note you want to insert faster. So it can be quite useful, and it's something that currently only Samsung offers. Samsung is also going to offer you the secure folder feature where you can perfectly get to store files or applications that you want that can only be accessed through your fingerprint. In fact, in addition to fingerprint, you can set a pattern that can be different from the lock screen if you want to have a second security filter. Then here you can safeguard everything you want and you could even change the name or icon to this secure folder to make it even more hidden. Although to exit completely securely, you must press the lock button and exit because if you exit by simply pressing the home button, the next time you want to access it will not ask for the fingerprint again. So consider it. If you are going to lend the phone to your little one, something that can be very useful is the Samsung Kids function, although it comes a little hidden. You have to edit the quick settings panel and in this part will be located the kids function for you to drag it to the position you want and once you do this and you can start using this mode that obviously can be very useful to set time limits and give permission to children to use only certain applications or games. By default Samsung offers you to download some that can be useful and fun for children but if you do not want them here you could also get to remove them completely depending on your taste and of course you could get to add applications that you already have installed in your main space outside the children's mode. Children will not be able to leave this mode and you can tell him if you want or do not want to give them some suggestions. Also games that have been verified by Samsung and also have available options for parental controls where you can select some time limit on screen or a schedule to go to sleep and authorize some contacts and give permission to the child to enter certain multimedia content on the device. If you do not want to give more suggestions of applications or games, you can deactivate this option and that's it. When the child wants to leave this mode, he she will obviously need your verification. Samsung also offers a private VPN with which you could have a more secure web browsing when you are connected to public Wi-Fi networks. It offers 1 gigabyte for free, but obviously if you want protection with more data, you could sign up for a plan. In more security issues, Samsung also includes an antivirus in collaboration with McAfee, although it is disabled by default. If you want to feel even more secure, you could activate it, although this could slow down your device a bit, so it is best to just be careful what applications you install and it would not be necessary, but in case you need it, there comes the fully integrated collaboration without having to pay anything extra. And if you get to lose your device in addition to the feature implemented by Google to try to find it, Samsung also offers these features. Simply you must go to the security and privacy section and then in the lost device protection section will be where you can enable the offline search and allow the detection of this phone. It is very important that you enable all the options if you want to have the utmost security of finding your device in case of any loss. Remember that Samsung has its own network of Galaxy devices, so you have a little better chance of finding your device compared to other Android devices. And like any Android device, you will also find the digital wellness function so you can see the time you spend on each application, and you can also set limits or time goals. In addition, from here, you could also manage your child's cell phone if you have an Android phone. And finally, remember that by pressing the on-off button five times, you can initiate an emergency call. The battery is 4,900 milliamps that is slightly larger than the last generation in that sense is an important evolution although one thing is the capacity of the battery and another thing is the autonomy time that you could get to achieve. In my tests I was honestly not surprised but a little disappointed in the foreground. If you did not know, I run this battery drainer that makes multiple calculations to consume the maximum power of the processor and in this case it lasted 3 hours with 18 minutes i.e. almost 2 hours less than I would have liked. So the processor really seems to be not so efficient in this regard, although always in the devices of the range devices with such powerful processors could consume a lot of energy in this kind of heavy tasks. So if you put the maximum demand on the processor obviously you will not have a battery life as extensive. But I also did a test running this battery drainer in the background while I was playing videos on YouTube. 
In that case, it improved a lot and reached seven hours and two minutes. So it has an excellent management of applications running in the background. And in that sense, if we had a superior experience than we have on average with other cell phones. So as a conclusion on battery life, if you do extremely demanding tasks can wear out faster than other devices. But if you do more balanced tasks, it will perform better than other devices. So it is up to you as a user what you prefer. But also, if you are one of the more demanding users, you could go as far as enabling the power saving mode to have a more extended time. And you could also enable this special option to have an even more extreme power saving mode that allows you to add only a few essential applications. But this is only used for emergencies. The 45 watt charger is sold separately. That is something that still annoys us a lot, but we are getting more and more used to it, unfortunately. It is also compatible with 25 watt charging and also with power delivery chargers so you don't have to buy this charger. You could also buy cheaper power delivery chargers. With 15 minutes of charging it recovered 32% power. With 30 minutes of charging it got up to 66% and the full charge finished it in 64 minutes. I think that's a considerably fast charge. Obviously it's not going to be the fastest on the market but it doesn't come close to disappointing either. Consider that it also has wireless charging and it also has reversible wireless charging. So you could put charging your watch or your headphones on the back cover of this device. Although it is a bit slow charging, but for some emergency, it could be useful. And to finish with this section, you should know that it has a good battery protection mechanism. Notice how you can activate this option and you have three levels. The basic protection will mean that if you leave it constantly charging, it will simply go down to 95 and then it will reactivate the charge to keep it almost always full. Adaptive protection will learn your routine and simply stop charging when you wake up if you leave it charging all night. And the maximum protection will completely block charging when the device reaches 80%. I like that Samsung gives you the option as a user to choose what level of protection you want or if you don't want any battery protection at all. This option, remember that that it will make your battery have a much longer lifespan so it is best recommended to have the maximum option if you want your battery to last for many years while retaining a good lifespan but it is up to you as a user whether you want to use it or not let's move on to connectivity in this case, Samsung offers support for 5G networks and note that in the data usage section will also allow us to select which applications we want to connect to the network through our mobile data plan and which applications we want to connect to the internet only with Wi-Fi. This way you can avoid unwanted surprises in your data consumption. And notice how this device also has ESIM support. In this case, I have added an ESIM. Remember that these type of SIM cards are simply by scanning a QR code so they are usually very useful when you are going to travel. So you could perfectly well have two lines without any problem and this is a very useful tool. Regarding Wi-Fi networks, in this case it supports Wi-Fi 6 with good download speeds although honestly it is not the most attractive feature of this device. We have seen on this channel other devices with my same Wi-Fi network that reach more than 500 megabits per second so I think it is not going to be its strongest point. Although obviously this can vary depending on the availability of your region, your router and the consumption you are having at the time of testing. But overall I don't think it excels in this area. It will also have Bluetooth 5.3, so it offers good stability in the connections with your accessories and it also has NFC so you can use this device to pay using Google Pay or some other applications by bringing the back of your cell phone close to the compatible banking terminals. Like almost all high-end devices, it does not have support for FM radio and its screen projection notice that yes, it is going to be very advanced as it has smart view with what you can do, the screen projection in a very advanced way. For example, you could minimize the application you are projecting to continue using your cell phone while you do the projection of another application, or you could have the screen of your cell phone off so it does not consume so much battery, or you could also hide the notifications on the projected screen. So it's an advanced projection, it also supports projection via cable with some HDMI adapter and it also comes with Samsung DeX mode so you could also connect to an external display to use this device in a desktop format. That is applications are going to run in a windowed format much like you would have with a computer. And if you connect a mouse and keyboard wirelessly you could practically have your portable workstation with this cell phone. It also supports Android Auto both wirelessly and wired. And while I'm on the subject, the port is USB-V to give you good transfer speeds. 
And with respect to the sensors, it has a very good variety and the proximity sensor seems to be more of a contact sensor than a proximity sensor because if it's not making direct contact with some object or your face, it's not going to be enabled. So it seems to be a simple proximity sensor unlike other devices. Regarding the ecosystem, Samsung offers something quite complete, although in Mexico does not distribute the Galaxy Book and that will remain my main complaint regarding everything that has to do with ecosystem. The rest of the features are very complete as Samsung offers its Galaxy Buds, Galaxy Watch, Galaxy Tab, and even through smart things you can connect with all their home-focused devices. So their ecosystem really is very complete. They even recently launched the new Galaxy Fit 3. All the accessories will connect very easily and in this case it's also going to have Samsung developed technologies like QuickShare to easily send files between Galaxy devices or between Android devices. And it has good technologies like MusicShare that will allow you to play music on multiple devices at the same time. You can also select to have your Galaxy Buds automatically connect to multiple devices that have your same Samsung account. In fact, from the tablet or from another Galaxy device, you could answer calls or messages that arrive to your main device. You also have options to continue your applications on other devices, although in this case limited to Samsung Notes and also the native Samsung web browser. It also has the option to share your camera between this cell phone and a Galaxy tablet. And it also comes with all the Windows integration already installed. So if your laptop isn't Samsung, you could still get to sync your phone with the computer quite easily. And it also has the multi-control technology, although in this case in conjunction with the Galaxy Book, which is not distributed in Mexico. So you could share the cursor and keyboard between all your devices for a much more advanced use. So it has good technologies, good integration, and I repeat through smart things, you could also access to control home devices. In this case, the SmartThings platform is very broad because it has compatibility with many manufacturers, so you could perfectly well add here all your controls. In this case, Samsung does not depend on Google Home like the vast majority of Android manufacturers. In fact, from the quick settings panel, you also have access to the control where you can preview all your devices on a dashboard, although you can choose whether you want it to work with SmartThings or you want it to work with other applications. Regarding cloud storage, Samsung offers a collaboration with OneDrive, so the gallery can be fully synchronized with your Microsoft account. Although obviously you're going to have to pay for additional storage if you want to have all your backup. Either way, it also has a partnership with Google that gives you a free GB spread across all of their services. So Samsung is feeling pretty strong in this regard. At the moment, the only thing it would lack to match Apple would be to offer you subscriptions to various services that at the moment are not here. Now let's talk about the performance. This device comes with the Exynos 2400, a processor that can become very controversial for many people. It also comes with 12 gigabytes of RAM that you can virtually expand with an additional 8 GB LA. And with respect to storage, we find models of 256 or 512 gigabytes, as you realize approximately two seconds on average to open each of these applications confirming that the performance is quite high, although it still seems to have some problems when you are switching between applications with small blank flashes. This is a flaw that I feel that Samsung still fails to correct. It's getting very picky, but I've really seen other devices that offer a much smoother transition from one app to another. Without seeing this kind of white screenshots, or in this case screenshots with the same color of the application. But if that does not interest you too much, notice that it does offer us a good performance. The opening of applications was quite fast and also the exchange is being very fluid. Although One UI is a system that offers us a lot of options and therefore could consume a lot of RAM. But notice how it comes with a good optimization. Now let's see how it behaves within some applications that can load multimedia content. And notice how it's still doing quite well. It's slowly loading the content, but once it's loaded, notice how the navigation inside the apps can become quite smooth and without any kind of problem. Therefore, this device definitely offers high performance for this type of applications. Obviously, in games, it can be a different story, but we will test it in a moment. But before we go to the games, let's test how it goes, exporting a video recorded in 4K with a total duration of one minute using clips from this device. Although it must be said that they were previously compressed and it took a long time time to compress them.
As you can see in this case, it seems that the speed is very good for exporting compared to what we have seen in other devices. But what I found curious was that in this case, when importing these clips, the editor decided to compress them, even though I specifically told him I didn't want to compress them. So it seems that the processor might be having some difficulty at the moment with this application. If you want some other editor, remember that Samsung offers a partnership with LumaFusion, which is a pretty comprehensive editor. In this case, in the Galaxy Store, may get to have some discount because it has collaboration with Samsung. I'm going to install it from the Play Store because I had already bought it here. So now I'm going to do the test editing from this other editor that has not compressed the videos to see more or less what would be the real power of this processor. I'm going to export using the presets already configured and let's see how long it takes. And that's it. I honestly found it surprising how long it took. It's extremely fast editing with LumaFusion. Consider that it was an edit on the K-Frame. It seems that Samsung's collaboration with LumaFusion did bring a good optimization. Therefore, it would be one of the best devices for editing videos according to these tests I am doing. Regarding the storage, you should know that the system uses a big part of it. Therefore, it would be best to get the most storage versions possible. Fortunately, Samsung has good tools to manage that storage. You can also see which apps or games are consuming the most and quickly delete duplicate files or take a look at the largest files you have on your device. So the storage, I think, is going to offer us a good experience. Just consider that you don't have the ability to put a micro SD card in it like we've seen on several Samsung devices before. To talk about games, let me open the Gaming Hub, which is the application where Samsung collects all the games you have installed, plus it allows you to run instant games. That is content that does not require any installation. So if you are one of those who prefer more casual content and do not want to consume space on your device, it could become a good alternative to entertain you without the need to use storage. But, if you are one of the most demanding in gaming, let me tell you the experience. In this case, we are going to count on the game booster that you can configure in this section. By default, it comes giving priority to gaming performance. But you should know that if you want the maximum possible performance, you could enable the alternative management, although Samsung anticipates that it might cause a little more heating. So, it's up to you as a user what you prefer. In this case, we test it as it comes configured, that is, without that option enabled. When entering a game, notice how you can open more tools in the game booster. For example, you can enable priority mode to avoid any distraction from calls or notifications. You can also make the screen lock if the game is downloading content so that it does not consume as much battery, and the game will continue to run so that the download does not stop. In addition to this, you can have a lock for the navigation buttons to avoid unwanted touches. You can also take screenshots or screenshot recordings as well. In fact, also here you have a shortcut bar to immediately open your applications and be able to answer a message without the need to leave your game. And finally, you will have a section for add-ons, also known as game plugins. These plugins can be downloaded independently from the Galaxy Store. Yeah, I've downloaded a few so you can see more or less how they work. For example, we have the shooting assist mode, which is going to allow you to keep a steady sight on screen, mostly very focused on shooting games. We can also install Game Booster Plus that would allow us to customize in a very specific way how we want the performance in our games. And it even has Frame Booster that would allow you to have an even smoother experience. However, this option was turned off in our tests, but you should know that you can turn it on. And finally, there is also a plugin called PerfZ that would allow us to have a constant monitoring of the frames, although you have to enable some permissions before you start using it. But in addition to the frame rate, it can also show you the CPU and GPU consumption, as well as the temperature of the device. And this is data that gamers generally like to have available. So you could get to have this whole experience enabled. Obviously, you as a user decide what you want and what you don't want to enable. In Call of Duty, notice that this device gives us the very high quality graphics at a maximum frame rate by default. In fact, we can go up to an ultra frame rate, but the graphics quality drops to medium. So let's do a test with very high quality at maximum level. And notice how it also also supports various graphics effects. So it looks like this processor comes much better optimized than past generations.
In fact, it would also allow us to have the experimental features of super resolution, variable speed shadowing and others. So it shows very good graphics compatibility in this configuration. If you choose the ultra frame rate, note how various effects are still available anyway, although not all of them anymore, but it still gives a good experience. Samsung will give full priority to the device not to heat up. Therefore, if you want an experience to the extreme of fluidity, you could enable the experimental functions, but by default it will offer us a good experience. In this case, it shows us good fluidity, although not totally perfect, but the average frames per second remains quite high. It does not have constant hitches that are noticeable or annoying for the user. But I insist, if you are one of the most demanding gamers, you may want to have an even smoother experience. In fact, you might notice a little more hitches when recording the screen. But even having this graphics quality and recording the screen, the temperature remained considerably low, coming in at one degree of a second. So I insist that Samsung seems to give more priority to temperature control and not so much to the 100% stable experience that gamers might demand. So the graphics is not 100% straight, but overall it does give us good performance. With the ultra rate, notice that this device is also going to give us a good experience. It does hit the 90 frames per second that it promises. So yes, you could get to have a smooth experience to take advantage of the high refresh rate display. In this case, interestingly, it seems to have gone even a bit to the previous test. Although again, when recording the screen, you might get to slightly notice a drop in fluidity. So if you're one of those gamers who's going to record the screen and want an ultra stable experience, on this device you're not going to find it with the default settings, but notice how the temperature stayed pretty low, having 38.8 degrees Celsius. So in our testing we can confirm that Samsung puts a very high priority on having a cool gaming experience, even though it might sacrifice a bit of stability. In the Legends game, we changed the auto setting to a much more advanced setting to bring the test up to par for this very expensive device. So we selected ultra detail at 60 frames per second. Although you know 60 frames per second actually means it's going to go up to over 60. So in this game, there was a point where it was trying to get to 120 frames per second, but it was getting a lot of jitter. So the maximum it got to was 112. In this case, it confirms to us that it's not a device that's going to go to the highest. So there were times where it did feel slightly frozen, but then it looks like the game came to be limited to 60 frames per second and in this case the stability was much better. So that's why you see the graph that can get a lot of variation. And again, here what strikes me is that it maintained a considerably good temperature, 42.1 degrees Celsius, despite playing at this fairly high graphics quality. Although the screen recording could slow down to about 30 frames per second, so it doesn't look as smooth, especially for the more demanding gamers. Since in other content, we have seen that the recording can reach 60 frames per second, which is remarkable, but will not happen in all games. And without recording, the screen obviously goes a little more fluid. In the Spongebob game, it gives medium resolution and quality by default, but for the test, we put everything in Epic at 60 frames per second to test this expensive device. And again, it confirms what I've been telling you, it is not a device 100% focused for gamers because it does not offer a totally stable experience. And in this case, we must also consider that this stage of the game is a bit complex graphically speaking, but even recording the screen can give a good experience. Note, I did not say perfect, so if you are one of the most demanding gamers, this is not going to satisfy you 100%. Especially because it is a fairly expensive device and surely in cheaper devices you could get to have an even better performance, although obviously you could get to sacrifice screen quality or camera quality in devices that are more focused on power. Let's say that here we find a good balance and again maintains a considerably good experience in temperature. In Henshin Impact by default, this device gives us the medium graphics quality, but for testing we bumped it up to the highest to see what it was capable of. So we selected the very high graphics quality with 60 frames per second and also the motion blur we set to very high. With this setting, we confirmed that the device can get to have an experience without as much stability as we would like. So it can get to have ups and downs in the frames. It is not something that stays 100% frozen, but it is not able to offer us a totally stable experience. However, even recording the screen, the result seems to me to be positive for a good number of users, but for the most demanding gamers, this will probably not be enough. 
However, note again how the temperature remains at 43.5 degrees Celsius, unlike other devices that have risen to over 45 degrees Celsius. So, Samsung again confirms to us that it places a higher priority on maintaining an experience that doesn't add up to too much heating. If you want, you can enable the experimental functions in the lab's menu and enable Game Booster if you want to push the performance to the top, but you should be aware that it will generate more heat. For the moment, this has been all regarding this device. A model that I have found to be very well balanced, it will obviously offer very good quality cameras as Samsung has accustomed us, plus a very good screen. The processor is pretty good, although it could fall a little short for the most demanding in gaming, but I think the software may be the key factor in case you are deciding to buy this device or any other brand, as Samsung offers many options that could be beneficial for you, but consider if you are going to use them, because if you are not going to use them, maybe you could consider other factors. For the moment, we have reached the end of this video. I hope you liked it. If you did, you know you can let us know, and we'll see you next time.